The New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of information presented on our site. We do not endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any member or physician, nor do we advocate any treatment. You are responsible for your own medical decisions. Now, I'm going to turn over the introduction of our speaker to Martha Butterfield, the program, or the webinar coordinator of NJCTS. Marty? Kelly, thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. Thank you for joining us. If you're new to our webinar series or a regular listener, I'm appealing to you to visit our website and make a donation that will allow us to continue this important programming. Before I introduce tonight's presenter, I would like to mention several events that all have an upcoming deadline of May 1st. Nominations for Educator of the Year and Medical Professional of the Year are being accepted now. This is a great opportunity to recognize New Jersey professionals that have made a difference in the life of your child living with Tourette. Scholarship applications for graduating New Jersey seniors with Tourette who are going on to either two or four year programs are also being accepted. Registrations are open for our 10th annual family retreat. Space is limited, so don't delay. This retreat is a great opportunity for kids and parents to connect with other families coping with similar experiences. Information on what's required to apply for or participate in any of these events is available on our website. Now, without further delay, I'm pleased to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Dr. Martin Franklin. This is Dr. Franklin's fourth appearance in our webinar series. He previously spoke on pediatric OCD, trichotillomania, and hoarding. Those webinars are available for free download on our website. Dr. Franklin is Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and Director of UPenn's Child Adolescent OCD, Tick, Trichotillomania, and Anxiety Group, otherwise known as Cottage. For over 20 years, Dr. Franklin has conducted clinical research projects on OCD, trichotillomania, Tourette syndrome, and related disorders. In collaboration with colleagues at Duke University Medical Center, he completed a pilot study on cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, for Tourette's disorder in adolescents and young adults. He's presented on the psychopathology and treatment of OCD, trichotillomania, and related conditions across the developmental spectrum, both nationally and internationally. He also continues to be active clinically in providing CBT for OCD and related conditions. Dr. Franklin is a member of the Science Advisory Board for the OC Foundation and the Trichotillomania Learning Center and was recently appointed to the Medical Advisory Board of the National Tourette Syndrome Association. Dr. Franklin, we're delighted to have you back. So without further introduction, I'll turn tonight's presentation over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Kelly, I, I think I need the control of the slide set. Um, I'm not coming up the way that I would like. Let's see. Here we go. All right, thanks so much. I want to welcome everybody for uh, tonight's presentation. Uh, sort of an irony in this, which is a lot of people have left my building because they're afraid of driving home tonight. Um, and I will talk a little bit about uh, phobias for driving and bridges and the like as we go. Uh, we also have to uh, think about, with all phobias, whether the fear is realistic. There are lots of things that people are afraid of, and they're not phobias, unless the fear is, 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 over, is overwhelming, is not a realistic evaluation of threat, and causes functional impairment. This, this is not about preference to diagnose phobia. You really need evidence of impairment, and you need evidence that the threat is not inherently dangerous. We'll talk about that as we go. So uh, I'm going to start by just a quick comment about pediatric anxiety. This is uh, Dr. Elmsley put in a, an editorial to the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years back. 
and just talking about anxiety is under-recognized and under-treated. And I think he's right. I also think we, we recognize in, in the Tourette's community that there are very high rates of comorbid anxiety, OCD specifically, but other anxiety disorders as well. So it's of relevance to the, to the kids that we see uh, who are struggling with ticks. So I think Dr. Elmsley got this one absolutely right. Summarizing his uh, view, uh, the reasons we may want to pay more attention to anxiety, up to one in five kids uh, at school age have some form of anxiety that would be classified as clinical. Uh, most of those kids are not seeking treatment, they're just sort of struggling through. Um, and sometimes that struggle uh, gets to the point where it begins to impair their functioning. And it's at that point where parents may, or even schools may, refer for treatment for a kid whose anxiety is now getting in the way of their social, academic, and personal functioning. Uh, we know that anxiety disorders have negative impacts in multiple domains. Uh, one of the things that we get concerned about with anxiety is derailing. So when kids start to miss school, when kids start to not go to certain places because they're afraid of being anxious, um, or when they decide that something is too threatening to, to tolerate, they start to pull back from their activities, and that, that can put them behind both academically and socially, and then it's hard to catch up. If a kid has missed seventh grade, for example, it's difficult to step in at eighth grade and feel comfortable, and, and that discomfort, some of which is realistic now, if you've missed that much time, uh, keeps kids behind. And we, and we see an educational underachievement effect from anxiety, which then spawns more realistic anxiety about academics, and it becomes a vicious cycle. We know later on there's association with depression and sometimes even suicidal ideation in kids who are anxious. And when we look into adulthood, we see uh, prediction of substance abuse problems, adult anxiety disorders, adult depression. There's a good reason to try to catch anxiety disorders earlier and try to intervene with effective treatments. And, and that leads to the topic tonight, which is about specific phobias specifically. We know, if you're looking at community samples, we have up to 10% of people in community samples, epidemiology studies where they randomly call people. Uh, we know that about 10% of community samples have a diagnosable specific phobia. This is adults. Uh, we know that those are associated with personal and sometimes academic and even social distress. Uh, the presence of a childhood phobia will predict adult phobias. Uh, we just mentioned before about anxiety in general, but this is true of, of specific phobias specifically too, that we have associations with anxiety and mood disorders, and those associations may well be uh, leading to people taking a drink to take the edge off in certain situations, and that may well perpetuate a cycle that we would prefer not be perpetuated. Uh, well, the way we think about it then is early treatment may therefore serve a preventative role, and what we know about specific phobias is they're typically the first anxiety disorder to onset. So it might be that you catch somebody with a specific phobia younger, and treat them and teach them how to handle anxiety and, and what to do and what not to do. And you may well be in a position to, to think about prevention. So they've learned some skills that are transferable to other situations in which they will later become anxious. And perhaps that can stem the tide of, of this whole wellspring of psychopathology. So that's the reason we're interested in doing something about it. When we're thinking about differentiating specific phobias from normative childhood fears, we think about a few different things. We think about the timing. We think about intensity of the fear, uh, duration of the fearful response, functional impairment. And we have to put it all in the cultural and family context. Timing, it may be that there are some, some fears you'd expect to see in two-year-olds, fear of strangers, and, and at three, fear of monsters and the dark and things like that. If those fears persist beyond the, the window in which you typically see kids move through that, that timing, uh, or mistiming, if you will, fears persisting beyond where you'd expect them to, to, to be absent, um, then that may tell you you're looking at a level of fear that uh, would be potentially diagnosable. The intensity, when there's a lot of kids who are uh, trepidatious about new dogs and in new situations and the dark, etc., but there may be some kids whose responses are pretty extreme. Uh, a good example with a dog phobia was a kid who 
upon seeing virtually any dog, would simply run in the opposite direction, even if that meant running into the street. And that intensity of response, obviously, was threatening in, in a way that the dog may not be, but also uh, uh, a, a sign that the, that the fear, discomfort, had, had crossed over into the level of phobia. The duration of fearful response, people might be uh, initially uh, trepidatious in a certain situation, but the kid who may worry for hours that the dog might come back uh, or the spider might come back won't go in a room in which they saw a cockroach ever again. Those kinds of things lead us to think maybe we've crossed over from something that was normative to something that's now going to be in the way. Functional impairment, the more it's getting in the way, you can't go to here, you can't go there. Um, you're so terrified of going to somewhere where there might be water. A good example would be a, a family whose 10-year-old daughter refused to go to their shore house because there might be thunderstorms. Um, so there's a kid who's now, her, her fear is so intense it's affecting everybody else. And in the cultural and family context, I need to know who's uh, also fearful and whether they're reinforcing fear messages or um, how they're handling the, the situation at home may tell me something about what I need to do with treatment when I get to that point. Some things to keep in mind, not all phobic reactions are phobias. There may be some other explanations. For example, just a few examples. Children with phobias and, and, and with OCD may, may each fear dogs. Uh, but typically, when, when, when I can convince a kid that the dog is gone and won't be coming back, the fear can abate, uh, whereas with, with, with somebody with contamination fear may now fear the, the items the dog touched or where the dog walked, which is suggesting it's not the, the fear isn't of the dog per se, it's something attached to the dog. Um, and oftentimes that, that has to do with sickness. I've, I've got a couple of cases where rabies is the concern. And so a fear of rabies for a dog that's long gone might, might, might give me a, an idea that I'm dealing with something else. Uh, we have phobias uh, and, and in, in emetophobia, vomit phobia, um, and in OCD you may also see the fear of getting sick, but those with OCD often have a much more elaborate fear network and varied methods of avoidance and, and getting rid of bad thoughts. Most, most specifically phobic kids don't try to get rid of bad thoughts, whereas kids with OCD and, and fear about getting sick may well spend a lot of their time doing that. Um, you can have a phobia, you can also have post-traumatic stress disorder and fear of certain situations, um, but with PTSD it's often a fear of triggering memories of, of, a, of a traumatic event that happened before. You do see some phobias in which uh, there is a triggering event, uh, may not meet the level of intensity required for a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, but, but the past event is reminding them of what could happen, but usually the focus is not so much on the memories, but the possibility that may happen again. I think a good example there would be dental phobia, in which uh, most people who have a dental phobia will, will identify some specific triggering experience, um, and then they're going to focus more on, oh my god, it's going to feel like that again, and I don't want to go. And avoidance of dental phobia, of course, of, of dental care, results in uh, worse dentition, which of course then affects uh, what happens at the next visit. So we have that vicious cycle going there in, in dental phobia. If you have a fear that's centered on catastrophic consequences of physical sensation, so I don't want to get, I don't want to see a spider because I might have a panic attack and I might have a heart attack and die, um, and the fear is less about the, what the spider will do than what your own internal sensations are, are meaning and going to cause, then you may be looking at somebody who's got either situationally bound panic attacks or possibly even panic disorder. Driving phobia, flying phobias are excellent examples. People with panic disorder may not like to fly because they're afraid of being trapped as opposed to afraid of a plane falling out of the sky. Same thing with bridges. People with panic disorder don't like to feel like they're stuck in traffic, whereas people with a driving phobia for bridges uh, may well be focused more on, on catastrophic outcomes that could occur on the bridge. And, and not just their own physical sensation. So those are the things you're looking for uh, when you're considering diagnosis and, and then considering a treatment plan if you're a provider. Um, when we think about treatment outcome for phobias, there's very little been done in the way of, of gathering data on the efficacy of pharmacotherapy. A lot of phobics uh, wind up getting a prescription for a short-acting benzodiazepine to sort of get through. 
and you know that has a uh, there's not a lot of evidence for long-term efficacy there and you have also a potential problem of, of, of developing tolerance to that medication. Uh, so we don't have much in the way of, of guidance from the literature in terms of treatment outcome for medication. We do have, in contrast, multiple studies from kids to adults uh, attest and across many phobias attesting to the efficacy and durability of, of cognitive behavioral therapy involving exposure, which I'll talk about more. Um, that literature, however, uh, has been characterized usually by cognitive behavioral intervention studies that have been comparisons to wait list or no treatment, um, and, and, and until recently. I'm going to walk you through the biggest and probably the most important study that's been done in the treatment of specific phobias in kids, which is the collaboration between Tom Ollendick at Virginia Tech University and Lars Ost, uh, University of Uppsala in Sweden a multi-site study, very large sample, and I'll, I'll talk to you about their treatment. Um, their treatment in particular in that trial was conducted in a rather efficient manner. Uh, it was a single set, elongated session, up to three hours. Oftentimes they took two and a half hours and, and did graduated exposure to the feared stimulus. Um, and the phobias included in that particular study, and, and you see these are common phobias, animal phobias, dogs being the most common, occasionally you saw cats. Uh, there are a few other less common uh, animal phobias that you might run into. Uh, birds, for example, might be one. Uh, natural uh, things such as thunderstorms, the dark, etc., cetera, um, are things, and, and, and occasionally things like tornadoes. Uh, you see kids who are, who are phobic of their occurrence um, and worried that they might happen soon, and they look at a gray sky and make assumptions or watch the Weather Channel, which is even worse probably. Um, insects, uh, I'm including spiders under that um, category. But we do know people in, in, the, in this particular region of the country, we have a big thing, uh, outbreak of stink bugs. And I actually took a stink bug out of my own house last night at the behest of my teenage daughters who are not terribly happy with its presence in, in, in the third floor room that they were sitting in. Um, and so you've got insect phobias. Um, dental phobias are also very common both in kids and adults and other kinds of situational phobias. When we're talking about fear of public speaking as a situational phobia, I think we're more likely talking about social anxiety disorder, a specific subtype of that. Uh, but we do have some people who are afraid of certain situations, which is um, water would be, would be one you might see. Um, and there are really a pretty wide variety of things people can be afraid of. Now, we're talking about Ollendick's trial. Uh, this was a study that was done a couple years back. And the uh, outcome is actually for single session, one session exposure versus uh, an educational support control. Which, and both treatments were compared to wait lists. And what you see on this slide here is a percentage of, of kids who were diagnosis free when reevaluated. 100% had a diagnosis of a specific phobia before this treatment started. What you see here is about 55% um, of the kids who got the one session cognitive behavioral treatment involving graduated exposure were feeling and, and doing a lot better at the end of that. I'll show you the long-term follow-ups uh, in a bit. And you see that it was, it was considerably more potent than the educational support, which led to about 22%. And I think one kid in the waitlist control uh, had, had experienced a, a significant reduction in their fear, which suggested it maybe wasn't terribly stable to begin with. But you see a clear advantage here uh, in terms of loss of diagnosis for the cognitive behavioral intervention conducted over the course of sometimes two and a half hours, sometimes three hours, the things that they were afraid of. Now, when we look at the long-term outcomes, uh, the follow-up data, at least six months afterwards, the kids who were maintained, um, they, they simply followed them up reevaluated them, and you see uh, that the CBT gains were maintained, and the ED support gains for the subset who responded seem to also be pretty well maintained, but there's still a significant advantage for having gone through the exposure treatment as opposed to simply learning about phobias and uh, getting some support from the therapist. Clear advantage for this. Uh, it speaks to the, uh, to the, both to the efficacy and durability of, of in this case, one session treatment. 
So when you're assessing kids, um, if you're at that point, things you may want to know. I, I certainly want to know um, about their comorbid disorders. Um, so I want to ask questions both of the parent and the child, depending on the age of the child. They may emphasize their report more if they're older and if they're teens, whereas if they're very young, I may want to emphasize uh, the validity of the parent report. Uh, but I'm going to use an a instrument, a diagnostic instrument. We use the ATIS, the Anxiety Disorder Interview Schedule. Uh, people can use other things just to make sure that there's no other primary or co-primary problem we should be focusing on. There are self-report measures out there in the literature, spider phobia questionnaires and fear survey schedule. Uh, behavior observation, I think there's no way to replace that. Uh, oftentimes people will say they're afraid of a particular item or object and then when you watch them behaviorally they don't have the same level of intensity of fear that uh, somebody with a phobia might. So you want to you pay attention to that. How, how, how fearful is this kid? Parent and teacher reports, uh, separate reports can be valuable. Sometimes the teacher may be able to tell you that this kid uh, can't go to the bathroom alone at all. Um, and sometimes the teacher may not see as much evidence for the phobias. Um, I pay attention to the self-monitoring and parent monitoring uh, information I, when I'm treating. Uh, both prior to and during exposure to fear-relevant cues. So if somebody tells me they're afraid of insects, I want to know how it affects them. I want to know how vigilant they are when they walk in a room, and I want to know what happens behaviorally and physiologically when they encounter an insect. And I also want to know if it's all insects or if it's just particular kinds, for another example. Um, when, I, when I'm doing this treatment, I really think about it as coaching. And therapists is a coach. And the coach, therefore, is going to be giving you information that you can make use of. They're going to be encouraging you to confront the situations that are hard, like any coach might. Um, coach, you know, I, I think that, that pretty clearly coaches who are screaming and yelling are less effective than those who might not be. And in the case of therapy, I want to, I want to be very gradual. If I see a kid getting more anxious as they confront higher and higher items on the hierarchy, I want to make sure that I'm not adding to that by um, escalating with them. I want to make sure, I want to pay a lot of attention to my own reactions, both to the stimulus and to the kid. If I'm treating a spider phobia and I'm spider phobic myself, I should probably treat myself before I go ahead and, and attempt to deliver this treatment to somebody else. We've had a couple of therapists over the years who um, had to treat injection and blood injury fears, and they themselves were injection phobic and, and tended to faint. And so what we needed to do was to we needed to get that therapist to, to work on that before they worked with a patient with that specific fear because we can't have fearful modeling. It's just not going to be in the patient's best interest. And and, and fortunately uh, phobia treatments work quite well. So if a therapist has some trepidation about an item or an object, they should practice with that item or object object or situation before they get in with their clients. Um, we, we really try to teach the kid to manage, treat their own anxiety, help them understand this model, help them understand what they should and should not do in the presence of the stimulus. Um, I, I tend to use a lot of humor if I can. Um, I am also conscious, very conscious in fact, of making sure that the kid doesn't feel like I'm laughing at them, that we're laughing together, uh, we're having a chuckle over the reactions they're having or, or, or the situations that we're finding ourselves in. But it's a shared and collaborative venture. Um, and I want to want to be conscious of that because some of these kids may have been teased. And in fact, if you have a sibling and you have a phobia, you may well have been exposed to that stimulus without your uh, voluntary compliance. And that, that's actually a way to probably make fear worse. So I really want to cut those kinds of unplanned exposures, if I can, um, out of family settings so this kid can move up the hierarchy more gradually. I, I also use fun time in therapy. This is hard work. If I've got a kid who's got a fear of bugs and they have to spend 50 minutes with me working on this, I'm going to make sure that we have a little bit of fun with things that they enjoy. Um, so I think that um, um, I need to go where the fear is. So if I'm in the middle of my office and I, I've got a kid who's got a fear of bugs, then my feeling is I've, I've, I can't be in my office. Um, I might be in my office for, for working my way through my collection of dead bugs, 
which always replenish every year because they tend to get a little bit um, less helpful to me when they no longer look like the bugs that they used to be. Uh, but we, we may work with dead bugs in my office and move our ways to situations in which we will find bugs later. One of the nice things about working with dead bugs is their movements are predictable. Uh, one of the things that's hard about bug fears is you don't know where the bugs are going to be uh, and where they're going to go next, uh, especially bugs that fly. So uh, those are the kind of things I, I may spend some time in the office looking at pictures and work my way up to my collection of dead bugs and work my way out as I go. But I need to go where the fear is. Um, and so we be, we need to be flexible in how we provide this treatment. And if we can't be flexible, then we have to think about how we can augment what we're doing in session with some live practices uh, in, in the situations that provoke anxiety. Um, I have a nice view of the, of the sky in my office. And if, if you don't have a nice view of the sky and you're working with somebody with a thunderstorm fear, then you need to go out and, and um, into the into the world and into the places where the kid can evaluate whether a storm might be coming. When I think about session structure, I, I, I put on here, uh, I'm going to review prior homework, I'm gonna, which means I'm going to be assigning prior homework. So I want them to get gradually, um, as we work on our treatment hierarchy, I want them to start confronting situations. I want them to be monitoring when they're avoiding, when they're having to come in contact with things that they're afraid of. The skill exercise for the given session is typically exposure. And I put here more than 40 minutes. Sometimes I'm going to run a double session if I need it. We know the, the one session treatment model, which runs up to three hours, is effective. It's not always practical to, to, to use in clinical settings. And sometimes it's hard for families to schedule. Uh, so we may, we may run a handful of sessions close together to, to get ourselves to that point where the kids had enough time and practice at the high end of the hierarchy where they get used to the stimulus. Um, fun activity, reward for effort. I want to spend some time on that. I also want to use that as a reward. And if a kid is avoiding in session, I can talk about the fact that you know time in our session is finite and you're going to lose some chance to, for us to play some video games at the end or look at something you want to look at on YouTube. Um, if you are um, continuing to avoid doing this. So we kind of encourage them to move forward rather than backwards. Um, and we're going to bring their um, parents into the session and, and summarize what we're doing. The younger the kid, the more likely I am to have the parent in for the entire session, especially if I've got a parent who's got some phobic reactions of their own, in which case they can watch how I do the exposure and how I react. Um, if, if there's a disgust base to the phobia, so, so oftentimes you'll see this with the, with the insects and sometimes even animals, um, that the person's disgusted and they, they make the quintessential disgust face. They turn their head, stick out their tongue. Those are the kind of things I want to see because certainly Dr. Ost, when he's uh, trained me in, in doing this work, he, he really wants the person to confront the situation and the stimulus without resorting to that. He, he conceptualizes that as, as a subtle form of avoidance, um, and he wants to remove that. So I, I, want, I want to look at that in session. And if I've got a parent who's also doing that, I want to instruct them about how we want to do this as well. And, and in their case, if I've got a parent treating a kid with a phobia, and I have a parent who's displaying fearful behavior, avoidant behavior, disgust, face, etc., I may want that parent to be doing some some exposure slightly ahead of the kid um, in order to get them to be uh, contributing to the to the exposure context in a way that would be helpful. So fear modeling is, is important. We want to pay attention to that. So we're going to talk when we start our treatment about uh, cognitive reactions. So what do you what does this make you think? So when you start to get exposed to the stimulus, what do you think? What's happening to you um, in, in your head? And, and are you evaluating this realistically or not? Uh, behavioral reaction. So how do you, when do you start to avoid? How do you avoid? Do you turn your head? Do you just run? And, and, and really finding out what their, what their tendency is, as I'm talking about. And we, we also want to talk about the physiology. Because essentially, the, the phobic reaction is a false alarm. So your body is determined quickly, and probably in this case inaccurately, that there's something dangerous going on here. So it's, it's, it's getting you ready to uh, for a fight or flight response, whether or not you need one. 
And at that point, um, I want them to understand how that process is working, and I, I want them to basically learn how to override that process. Because if you determine the stimulus isn't dangerous, then your, your task is to try to stay in the situation long enough to get used to it. And so that's what I'm trying to teach them at the beginning. I talk about the critical role of negative reinforcement. So every single time you um, uh, do something that's in the service of avoiding and you feel better, that's going to make your phobia worse. I had an excellent example recently where a kid with a fear of the dark had set up some kind of a little, uh, almost like a, uh, a trap in which they were, uh, their fear, the fear was mainly of the dark. And so the kid had set up some sort of elaborate system where there were a couple of candles around the bed, and they would notice that they'd been moved. And um, we we all we needed them to be able to uh, drop those superstitious behaviors so we could test the hypothesis that this was dangerous. And of course, when you're doing with things like that, you might be better off working with that first during the day, working away so as sort of as the evening progresses. So at, at the twilight hour. And then as the early evening progresses, so it's dark, but everybody's still up, you may want to do some practices of, of that kind of fear of the dark or fear of being alone um, and dropping all the, the avoidance behaviors, subtle or otherwise. Um, I'm going to give them the rationale for why we want to confront situations that provoke anxiety. If they're false alarms, your body will eventually learn that these false alarms are not accurate uh, depictions of threat. And as a result of that, with repeated exposure, you may well see a reduction in the frequency and intensity of those fears. And that, that's what we're going to teach people to do. The, the tool uh, mainly is exposure, and it's, and it's staying in situations instead of avoiding. I don't tend to do a lot of relaxation or other kinds of methods because I feel like I'm sending the wrong message in that case. I'd rather crawl up a hierarchy and go slowly then have them resort to all sorts of methods to reduce anxiety in the moment. Because I just told them it was a false alarm. And if it's a false alarm and it's uncomfortable but not dangerous, why am I giving you all these techniques to make yourself feel better in the moment? So I think they're theoretically inconsistent, and I'd rather just go slow if I can. Uh, the emphasis upon skill building, uh, getting used to something. Um, I, I coach baseball, and I had a couple of my little guys moving up to the live pitching from the pitching machine, and they were all afraid of getting hit by the ball. And so we basically did some skill building exercises where um, I lined them up and I threw wiffle balls at them. And I had them develop the skill of getting out of the way. So we, we must have thrown probably 100 wiffle balls at these kids. And, and they don't hurt much. The kid gets used to it. But more importantly, they developed the skill of determining whether a ball is coming at them or not and how to turn properly and protect their hands. And by the time we were done throwing wiffle balls at them, they were less fearful for the most part and better able to, to make that differentiation of threat versus non-threat, which is really what we're trying to do with all of this. Defining the role of the family, I'm going to do that in early sessions. With Again, with older kids, I want some uh, family to accept a less direct role. Um, with younger kids, they need to be more actively involved. And they may well be in my session as I'm doing the exposures. I also want to find out what the child can already do, because uh, there, there may be situations in which you can confront the situations that provoke anxiety because you're highly motivated, for example, um, whereas there are other situations in which you have a much harder time. So a kid with a fear of heights um, may be able to go out tomorrow and, and get on the high hill and go sledding, but they may be far less willing to do that when it comes to something that they're less motivated to do, like go to the fourth floor classroom in their school. So we have to pay attention to how that works. What can you do already? What, what things motivate you to confront your anxiety-provoking situations? And how can we build that into our treatment? Now, this treatment sounds like it might get complicated. I think this is probably the easiest way to simplify the message. And, and I think it works rather well, especially with kids, uh, where all of this talk about physiology and, and uh, tripartite models of anxiety, I think I think it, it can be a bit much. And so I, my inclination is to try to do it as simply as I can. And I would say at this point, um, this might be the simplest way to do it, which is my own daughter giving me advice um, about why I should say only one sentence to the people I was training back in 2001 instead of taking three days to tell them. And I think she probably synthesized the literature better than anybody I've ever met. Um, I've since used this um, 
this little sentence as a title for my talks, and I usually put it in every talk because I want as much as I can, if I'm, I'm dealing with kids, I want them to understand the underlying concepts. I want them to understand why we're moving forward instead of trying to just get rid of fear. We are trying. always through. That's a Robert Frost quote that I'll sometimes uh, bring in to remind us of the, the value of doing that. So um, I, I spent a good deal of my childhood in Ireland, and in Ireland, shoots and ladders is actually depicted as snakes and ladders. And I think that this is a nice example of how treatment will work. Uh, you start out at one, you roll the dice, and sometimes you happen to uh, wind up getting, um, which is nice, um, you hit a ladder and you make some significant progress. There are also times when you happen to hit a snake. And in the, in the game metaphor, you go backwards. Um, so I want kids to understand, and that this is a nice metaphor to, to make this point, which is as long as you continue to roll the dice, progress doesn't have to be perfectly linear. You can roll the dice and eventually you're going to get to the top. Just keep moving. So there are going to be times when it goes well. There are going to be times when you're not as anxious as you thought. There are also going to be times when, when you struggle. And that's OK. Just keep rolling the dice. Let's figure out why that was hard, break it down, keep moving. So what is a hierarchy? Hierarchy basically is a ladder. And it's organized from low, medium, to high. And so the kid, I will find out what the kid can already do. I can find out what a little bit of anxiety looks like in this kid, what more anxiety looks like and what are the peak um, anxiety experiences. So for example, if it's, a, if it's a snake phobia, I might be able to um, get a kid to say that even simply looking at a, at a, at a shoelace, that's sort of move, wiggly shoelace might be a, a low level of anxiety because it's uh, um, simulating snake movements. And so that might be a, a place for me to start. I can start using uh, both YouTube and other forms of the internet. The example of, of YouTube, I think, is helpful because you can get movement and sound in there, whereas still pictures might be lower level. Um, and I can work my way up. I can use movies. I can use whatever whatever method I need uh, to help them confront the stimulus. And then I may move from those things to uh, live depictions, or, or in the case of the bugs, dead depictions, and slowly but surely work my way into the situations that are most anxiety provoking for them. So just a ladder, low, medium to high. This is my low spider phobia example. There might be some kids for whom I have um, uh, you know, start this low, silly, silly looking uh, cartoon spider. I get them used to this. I get them used to stimuli like this. And when you're working with kids, you want to be working not just with one version, but with multiple versions, all of which are relatively low. Uh, so get the kid used to this, and then I may move myself up to, uh, this is the medium spider, who looks kind of cute, actually. He doesn't look very spider-like to me. Um, so we get used to him. And then the decision, of course, is do I want to move to live spiders at this point, or dead spiders? Or do I want to continue on my way up the hierarchy of simply looking at depictions? It depends. And uh, the next one, if you happen to have a spider phobia, my guess is you will not enjoy the next slide. Uh, so those of you who wish to avert it, avoid, feel free. Uh, but this is the top of my spider hierarchy. And I would say in this case, um, we don't encounter these much in real life. Uh, we have enough spider fear in this clinic where we even have a tarantula. And so if we can get to the tarantula level, and my guess is the common house spider that you're going to encounter in the Northeast is going to pale in comparison to that. So if I get a kid used to that, it's going to be so much easier to work on some of the other things. And so that's why I'm thinking about being ambitious in terms of how I'm setting the top of the hierarchy. And again, I never do anything the kid doesn't agree to. I don't make the kid do anything. I'm really clear about the rules. I don't like surprises. I tend not to do any of that sort of stuff. Uh, we, we want really uh, motivated kids who know that we're on their side. No surprises. So with my dog phobias, I may start as low as uh, cartoon depictions. There's not much um, uh, angry or confrontational about blue. So we may start with blue. We may start with still photos of blue, work our way up. Kid gets used to that and is not avoiding and is feeling um, encouraged that I'm going to move my way up to something like this, maybe pictures. 
Um, but this will also be an example, sort of a cute little guy here, um, of somebody I may want to work with um, when we get to the live dogs as well. I do want to know, though, because sometimes you, you can't assume that it's going to be easier for any particular kid to wor work with small dogs as opposed to large dogs. First of all, the younger the kid, um, small to us may not be small to them, and especially if you've got a small dog that's yippy and jumps. Uh, a small dog that's yippy and jumps might be harder for a kid than a bigger dog who's, who tends to be more passive. So I've got my medium dogs here, uh, and we've been here in, in our unit. Um, we have lots of, of uh, folks here who have dogs, and we have, we have a hierarchy set up for most of them, and, and we do, from on, on occasion, bring the dogs into the office, and uh, we do this work either up here or outside, depending on what's more relevant for the kid. So this might be a medium dog, and this is actually my dog on the left, and this is probably a two-year-old picture, maybe a year and a half. Um, he's now considerably larger than this. He's in Newfoundland. He's about 190 pounds. And what's great about him as a stimulus is he's, he's quite pleasant. He, he's got very good people skills. Um, he will lay on the ground. If it's a small kid, he'll get right down in his, uh, on his belly and let people pet, pet him. He's not jumpy, uh, so he's good in that way. Uh, but in, for people who are afraid of large dogs, he is very large. And so we, he may be the top of somebody's hierarchy. He may be the middle of somebody else's. And that's where you want to spend some time figuring out what's, what's the kid afraid of and, and what's going to be um, most relevant to expose him to. And his name is Gatsby. And he's, he's been here more than a few times now. Uh, with anything that you're doing for kids, I think you want to reward them for effort. Um, and, and the younger the kid, the more important it is to make external rewards part of what we're doing. Um, and we have in this, this is an example I borrowed from John Passantini from the CAMS trial, uh, where the kid, if, if they, you, you fill out one of the white circles every time the kid does an exposure or comes to session or um, hands in their, their self-monitoring homework. And then, you know, the, you have a certain number of uh, filled-in uh, circles that get you a trip to the zoo. Now, if you have a phobia of zoo animals, then that's probably not the reward you want to use. But you definitely want to get to the zoo anyway. Uh, so those are the kind of things you want to pay attention to is rewarding effort. And you're rewarding effort in, in the middle of it. Even if a kid's anxious, I'm, I'm going I'm to tell them they're doing a great job. I'm going to talk about the definition of courage not being the absence of fear, but the willingness to function despite fear. And kids can really, I think, um, understand that. And they, they like being noticed for having been, been brave. So when I'm starting uh, cognitive behavioral intervention for specific phobias, I'm tending to start with this, uh, really the lowest items I can get away with. With a little bit of fear and the kid has a success experience, I make a big deal out of those successes, even if the kid's sort of saying, oh, it wasn't that hard. I'm still over the top about it because I want them to feel like uh, I'm on their side and I'm going to be encouraging as we do this treatment. Um, coaching and, um, and especially encouraging to drop overt and covert avoidance behaviors. So if they can simply stay in a room with a spider, I'm going to be super happy and uh, we may move closer over time. The spider may be covered for a little while. I may take the cover off. Um, and I'm going to go as slowly as I can at those early sessions to get that kid to remain as part of my treatment um, group here. And um, troubleshooting and planning exercises together. I want to ask the kid what went well. What do you think was easier than you thought? What do you think was harder? How can we make this better? Uh, collaborative venture if we can. And encouraging patience on the family's part. This is going to take us some time. I know there are those one session, three hour phobia treatments that are out there, but I still want to make sure parents understand this may take us a couple sessions, and it may take more than that, depending on the kid's willingness to tolerate discomfort. <clears throat> I give homework. I ask them to do graduated exposure to feared situations. Usually, if I get to a, let's just say I get to a relatively low level of looking at um, cartoon spiders in a given session, I may then send the kid home to look at the cartoon spiders we looked at or something even easier. I want, I want to be climbing the mountain with them. Um, I'm going to encourage them to use their skills and their understanding of anxiety to support exposures that are doing it. Uh, anybody who, who's uh, doing the work that they've agreed to do and is on a, on a reward system should be rewarded. 
Make sure parents don't forget about that. And we want to consider any adjustments we need to make. So if something was much easier in my office than it was at home, then we've got to dial the exposures back a little bit at home. Or I need to push further in session to make sure that those uh, low level exposures are easier at home. Just modify that as you go. Um, as I'm moving up, I'm noting any any changes in their impairment and in, in decreased symptoms to highlight their improvements. Um, I may show a kid who's already looked at some cartoon dogs or uh, stink bugs or spiders. I may show some other ones, and if they have no reaction to them, I'm, I'm going to ask them to remember what, how they might have reacted as a way just to sort of remind them that we're making the progress that we uh, set out to make. Um, encouraging them to choose among equivalent situations for the next exposure. Again, it's about buy-in. It's about this being not me telling you what to do, but how, we, how do we think clearly about confronting this fear together. Um, and preparing patients and families to reach the summit to do the highest things which are coming next. And confronting those situations repeatedly. That's really important. When you get to the top items, I don't want a kid to be able to handle just one big dog. I want to get multiple dogs. I want to get dogs with different kinds of temperaments, different kinds of demeanors. With dog in particular, I also want to teach them a good deal about dog behavior. Uh, so when dog has his, his ears pinned back and his tail is still, that is not the dog you want to be confronting. Uh, teach them how to have to, how to, a knowledge base where they, they understand what's dangerous and what's not. Uh, snakes are another example. Really understanding and be educated about snakes where you know which ones are um, scary and which ones are not. Uh, there are different markings. I, I spend a lot of time doing education because I'm it's, 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 um, silently and in, in, in a clandestine manner sometimes doing a little bit of exposure as I'm doing that education, but I want the kid to know as much about the stimulus as he can know. Uh, Continue reminders to use their tools um, and c confronting those high-level fears in multiple contexts is really important. Um, as we get to the point where I feel like they've summited and they've done the things they need to do, I want to make sure they're, um, they're knowledgeable about what they've done and, and why this got better. Um, if they have some evidence in their lives going forward that they're losing ground, I want to teach them what they can do, um, what they already know. Uh, I, I tell kids all the time, you're, you're, not, you're not the same kid anymore. Because now you know how to understand anxiety and fear, and now you know what to do and what not to do about it. What not to do is avoid. You want to confront situations to provoke stress, uh, whatever those may be, uh, assuming they're not inherently dangerous, and we spend a lot of time talking about the difference. Uh, we talk about anxiety and stress and their relationship to phobias. Sometimes if you've uh, got a lot of tough stuff going on in your life, you may be uh, a little more vulnerable to a return of fear, and that, of course, requires uh, moving towards that fear rather than away. Um, I do ongoing contact and booster sessions with kids. There are some kids, um, insect phobias and uh, thunderstorms, for example, where I can really only treat them in a particular window effectively, and I may, I may bring that kid in the following season of relevance and see how we're doing then, because uh, um, especially in the Northeast this year, there's there not a lot of uh, bugs running around. It's been quite awful up here. So, I try to teach them that anxiety is transient. Anxiety comes and goes. I try to teach them that avoidance is the way to strengthen fear and exposure is the way to weaken it. Uh, you, you can't get used to something if you don't do it. And, and so that's something else I want to teach them. Is you're going to get used to it by doing it. Um, I also want to tell them that often we find that, that people are more afraid before they do the exposure than they are during the exposure. Uh, anticipatory anxiety is often higher with specific phobias, and I want to educate them about that. We also talk about feared consequences, identifying what it is you're afraid will happen, and using exposure to disconfirm these. So snake phobia is a good example, where a lot of people are afraid and, and disgusted by the fact that snakes are wet. What you find out? when you hold snakes is they're actually quite dry. And so you can disconfirm uh, one of these fears pretty quickly. And that may well, and again, if you're, if you're talking to the kid while they're holding the snake, um, that may also serve, that information will serve to help them think clearly and also they're holding a snake, which means that they're, they're doing exposure and you should see some degradation of fear over time in the presence of the stimulus as long as they don't avoid. 
So when you're in school settings, uh, there are some anxiety problems that may become painfully evident. I think one of the ones that we encounter a lot with schools is fear, the fire bells. The kids who don't like fire alarms, the kids who are afraid that they might ring, loud noise kids, the kids who don't want to go to an assembly because it's too loud, etc. cetera. Um, schools can be unbelievably helpful um, in, in promoting the same kinds of um, principles that we promote in treatment. The goal should be to reduce avoidance voluntarily um, and facilitate use of more adaptive coping strategies, meaning gradually confronting situations that provoke distress. Um, I think the even if the kid's in treatment, the school should be uh, uh, in a potentially important role to um, help that kid while they're in treatment to make sure that they're confronting situations that provoke anxiety. And that's, that's really what we're shooting for. I don't like involuntary exposures. I don't like surprises, and I don't want I don't want any of that to be happening. But some of it you can't avoid. I mean, if you have a real fire drill, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, but with the kid I know who has a phone who has a vulnerability to that fear, uh, in that kid's case, I certainly want to make sure that they are getting encouragement to uh, and, and maybe even information in advance. That's a kid who may need to know what time the fire drill is coming, uh, so that you have a kid who's preparing and prepared and has support in getting around that. So when is the time to do something about a phobia? I think it all comes down to functional impairment. If it's distressing, interfering, it can't be managed successfully at school or at home. Um, there's also another issue about timing. So it may be that somebody is highly fearful about some a situation or stimulus for a brief period of time. If that doesn't go away over the course of a couple of months, it may be uh, time to send them somewhere. And, and, and the where to refer, there's a couple of resources here um, as far as identifying therapists who do cognitive behavior therapy. As I said before, uh, medication, uh, we don't have a lot of information about the efficacy of medication for specific phobias, um, but we certainly know that if, if there's comorbid anxiety or other kinds of things, psychiatrists can, can be a good uh, place to start. Um, but these organizations are places where uh, they hold therapist lists, and you may be able to find something uh, wherever you may be by starting there. Uh, somebody's local to us, we do a ton of uh, phobia treatments, injection treatments, and you name it. Uh, we see all sorts of different kinds of phobias, and you know, we're, we're a relevant source for folks who are local. Um, and, and ironically enough, there are times where people are referred to us from South Jersey, and the parents are having a difficult time uh, driving over the bridge that's required to come to the treatment because of their own phobias. And so we may well, in that case, want to treat a parent before treating a kid. Um, and, and if you're treating a bridge phobia, one of the things you've got to do is get the person to, to basically buy about 25 tokens and go back and forth multiple times because uh, you're usually not on a bridge long enough to experience some, some anxiety reduction in the moment. And so if you drive over a bridge and your peak anxiety is at at the top and then drive off the bridge and your anxiety goes away because you're now off the bridge, it's not an optimal situation. So we, sometimes I send people to the bridges at rush hour uh, to work on that specific fear so I can keep them up there longer. Okay, and I believe that's my last slide and I am amenable open to questions at this point. Okay, well thank you very much. Great presentation. And I'm going to get started right away with um, some questions. I have a question about general anesthesia or sedating drugs mm -hmm. and whether or not CBT could be used. It's not really the procedure that's the problem. It's the anesthesia. So I'm guessing maybe the, I don't know, maybe the fear of not waking up from the anesthesia. I'm, I'm not sure. It doesn't. Yeah, say. I think that's exactly the question I would be asking is, is What's the nature of that fear? You need to do a good functional analysis. Is it the feeling of losing consciousness? Is it the fear that you're not going to wake up? And what are, what are, the, what are the surrounding stimuli that are of relevance? Because we may be able to do some exposure to that via imaginal exposure. We may be able to do some exposure to that via uh, discussion. Sometimes it's psychoeducation. If people have, have, have an idea that you're, you know, there's a 50% chance you won't wake up, then I want to provide them with information. So it really depends on what the what the fear might be. And sometimes it's simply being in the presence of the medical equipment. If that's enough for me to have the fear come in, 
then I may be able to do some exposure to that. But I, I wouldn't be um, uh, putting people under general anesthesia as a, as a method of um, treating that fear necessarily because it's probably not recommended that people go under general anesthesia without having to. Okay. Um, I had a question um, that I actually had needed a little clarification on. So, so the question is, how would you address a fear of riding home on the school bus? Specifically, the student expresses fear of being left by the driver. And if this child knows that mom is not going to pick him up at the end of the day, he, he won't even, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll go to school, but he won't go into the classroom. He just he will stand in the hall because he just doesn't want to go home on the bus. Right. I, I think I would want to understand, again, a, a, in a lot of detail, what the, what the surrounding cognitions are. Uh, I'd also want to know in that case if we have a history of, of a kid having been left or having heard about a kid being left. Uh, I want to deal with those um, uh, experiences as well. And I suppose that one of the ways you think about this is, is, is to do simulation. So it might be that having this kid driving with a neighbor and having this kid driving in you know, an, an optimally a, a, you know, a van-like object uh, with, with a parent present, um, I, may, I may be able to create a hierarchy that way. Um, but I think most of these hierarchies are going to be determined in large part by, by a pretty detailed discussion with the kid about what they're afraid will happen. And then uh, what we're then left to do is to gradually test those theories the kid has. So, so you said if you get on, on, on a, on a, on a uh, trans transportation of any kind, if you got into transportation and your parents weren't with you, that um, bad things would happen and you'd be left behind. Let's, let's, let's see if we can find that out by having you drive around the block with a neighbor. And then we then we would work our way up, and 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 I think with school bus, we've also got the potential uh, contributing factor of being around kids who might be making fun of you or might look at you funny. You may you may not be doing anything. You may just be worried about it. Mm. Uh, so it could be that you know driving in an empty school bus uh, in some ways being e easier for some kids, harder for others. And lots of different ways you could test. Yeah, school buses are a scary place. I think for kids overall, just the idea of getting on it and and you know being there right. alone, alone, and, and for and not some, really and for, alone. Yeah, right. And for some, that that's a social anxiety, and for others, it, it, it's more about these outcomes that are not realistic. Yeah, um, assuming they haven't they haven't happened before. Um, question about um, something less tangible, such as parent abandonment or nighttime separation or fear of having more than one friend. What activities would you would you suggest would be best to uh, initial and and for the for, to initiate some low exposure? Yeah, I, I would think that things like parent abandonment starts to get me into separation anxiety, and I would think that. Um, the way I've done it here in the clinic with separation anxiety is I've sometimes had a kid um, tolerate or will go outside and you know, onto Penn's campus and tolerate having a parent um, walk five feet away. And we get used to that, then we have them walk 10 feet away. Then we get used to that, then we walk 20 feet away, we have them turn a corner. I'm doing gradual exposure. I'm going to send them home to, to do these kinds of practices. I want to find out what that kid's fear is. Um, you know, is it that the parent's not going to come back? Is it that something's going to happen to the kid and they're not going to be able to come back? And that's going to help me determine where, where I take those things next. So again, there's always, with every fear, there's always going to be a, a, a pretty detailed functional analysis, really figuring, trying to figure out the why as best you can, because once you figure out the why, that's going to dictate the exposures. And, and then you just do them from low, medium to high, and you, you go from situations that are about a little bit anxiety-provoking. The, the issue about you know, having one friend um, my guess is that there's there's some social elements to those discussions we'd want to mm -hmm. understand before we did exposure. So if, if it's a fear that the one friend, um, would, you know, the, the close friend would then be offended, um, then I'd probably want to do some exposure to um, uh, having that having them play with three kids and having them play with four kids and, and slowly but surely confronting the situations they're afraid of. Do you think it's it's um, 
it, a part of the fact that, you know, kids these days, there's so much that you hear casually on the radio or the TV about missing kids. There's such a, a way, I think, a lot of information that's out there now that kids pick up on about kids being, kids disappearing. Um, right. And do you think that that promotes that fear for kids in some way? I, I would think, and, and, and so you've got to be mindful of your exposure to the news and, and to other kinds of things. But, but you, you're not going to be able to, to stem that tide. I think what you want to, and I tell kids this all the time, which is there's actually great comfort in math. So yes, these things could happen. Let's think realistically about how often they actually do. And, and I'll have a kid, and I'll, I, I'll, I'll do this little, little example with them of going through how many robberies have, have there been in their neighborhood that they're afraid of people breaking in. How many robberies do we know of in the last year? Oh, that might have been one or two. Okay. So how many houses are there in your neighborhood? And so let's, let's put as the denominator of this particular example, um, every house times 365 days. <laughs> so all of a sudden now we're looking at a giant denominator, and it's two over the giant denominator. And when I when I when I calculate that on, on, the, on the on the on the calculator, I, I wind up with something that starts with a point zero 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 zero, etc. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't tell them there's a guarantee that it won't happen, but what it does tell them is it's extremely likely not to happen. And then I get to get them to tolerate the discomfort of not knowing for certain. Now, to me, okay. zero, 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 0006 um, is those are pretty good odds. I like those odds. I would take those odds to Vegas. Um, but <laughs> at the same time, I, I, I want them to be able to understand that there's no realistic way to get a guarantee that bad things won't happen. And, and when kids are asking for those guarantees, I'll often say, we don't have a guarantee right now that I'm not going to die in five minutes. I don't think I am. Um, I could. And you know, if I do happen to, would you mind letting the secretary know? But but this, to me, what what I what I'm trying to get the kid to understand is we don't have people live all the time without guarantees, and so I want them to understand that when anxiety comes in here, it, it's almost like it, it it steals from you your ability to realistically evaluate things. You got this false alarm going off, and now you're concerned about things that are not logically likely. And, and I'll I'll tell kids all the time, how did you get here today? You know, and the kids, oh, I, d I drove with my mom or I, you know, I, I took the bus. So that's interesting. So you're able to do things that involve some risk. But when it comes to being alone, for example, you, you're not willing to tolerate risk there. And so I get them to mm. think about what, whether they're being logical. And if they're being, if they're being illogical, meaning they're exaggerating a risk, that shouldn't automatically make them feel better. But I want them to use that information to encourage them to stay in the situation. Let's find out. Let's find out. Okay. All right. Um, how would you approach the treatment for social anxiety? I think social anxiety is far more complicated. I think it's far more um, uh, difficult to treat than a specific phobia. And if, I, if I'm looking at the most specific phobia-like uh, uh, syndrome in social anxiety, it's a fear of public speaking. And the fear of public speaking can come from a variety of different places. And for some people, it's about not having had a lot of practice at it. For some people, it's more about um, uh, not liking the physical sensations that come when you're speaking, even if you're an experienced speaker. And so there's a combination of, of confronting the situation that provokes anxiety, meaning having to go and give speeches uh, repeatedly. And then also having to pay attention to whether or not your beliefs about it are realistic or not. I, I, I want to ask a slightly different question on that same topic, though, because mm -hmm. that question was posed by the same mom that that we talked, we replied to just a bit ago about having only one friend. So I right. think we're talking about a child here who's not going to be doing public speaking. But see, and you mentioned in your answer about social phobia. So yep. Yep. Yeah. address and, that and, a little bit. Sure. And, and so you know, here, here it sounds to me like the specific fears have, have to do with interactions with other people. And so it could be that if that is indeed the case, I want to find out if it's what other people. Is it more boys than girls? Is it more adults than kids or kids than adults? If it's known kids versus unknown kids. 
So that begins to allow me to create some kind of a hierarchy. And with social anxiety, oftentimes the fear is, is and almost by definition, the fear is that uh, you're going to do something humiliating or embarrassing that people aren't going to like you. And those are also testable hypotheses. And so in, in, in session, we'll actually do a lot of simulations and practices of interacting with people and, and let's just see what happens and find out whether the bad things you're afraid of will occur. So I, I, and so I may do practices like that, simulations in my office. I'll then go out to campus and ask them to ask people what time it is or ask them to buy a stick of gum um, and see whether or not the uh, people react the way that they're afraid that they will. And then we, we generalize from there. A lot of times kids with social anxiety are not concerned about strangers as much as they are uh, the people they have to confront every day, their classmates and their peers. Um, and so doing some grad, you know, I want to understand what it is they're afraid will happen. And I want to confront the situations in which they're afraid that will occur, and we'll see whether or not they do. OK. Um, I have a question. And this one actually is interesting, because it's a, um, a, about a junior in, in high school. Mm -hmm. And this mom is saying that sh this, her daughter has a lot of phobias. But one in particular has to do with the oven and the counter cooktop. She won't touch them, and she, she's just not comfortable around doing any kind of cooking. She said right. that she's going to do the rest of her life using her microwave. And incidentally, she has some other phobias too, clowns and insects right. and stuff, stuff like that. Right. So the question is, how do we push? What do we do? Push for therapy? Have her just want it for herself? Because at this age, you can't drag her there. Yeah, yeah that's right. And, and, and I think that you, uh, to me, I'd be very interested in knowing whether that's about um, fear of fire or whether it's about something else. So we spent some time on that. I, I think the bottom line is you, know, you can only take kids so far. And, and, and at their age, absolutely right. You can't make somebody do something. Um, you can leave those opportunities open. One of the things that you can do is you can also decrease, um, if there's a lot of um, accommodation going on around the phobia that the kid gets their own special meal made by somebody as opposed to having to do it themselves, that some of that can be reduced to, to put a little bit more uh, heat, if you will, on the kid needing to do something about it. In the end, um, I think people are going to going to ultimately make their own choices. What I wouldn't want to do in a circumstance like this is start a therapy that, that I'm already going to have problems with compliance. Because we know mm. from the OCD literature that, that between session compliance and CBT uh, is highly predictive of outcome. So if I have a kid who's telling me they don't want to do this, they're not willing to do this, and I've got a highly motivated parent who can really see further than the kid can about how unrealistic this is, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a treatment that doesn't work, and I'm going to have a kid now that concludes that the treatment doesn't work. So I'd rather wait on a kid like that unless it's so impairing that it's ruining their lives and we have to do something. Uh, but so, this one doesn't sound like one of those. Yeah, and the mom's comment where she's going to be heading for college, and, um, you know, she just is hung up on this stuff. But if she's not yeah. willing, then it doesn't make sense. Why yeah. would you push it? And she may, she may well become more willing in that college context. So when, yeah. when her friends are functioning better and she's noticing that she's not, my guess is that the, the, the contingencies are going to change. It's also the case that if you are living on your own and there's no one else you can ask to cook for you, that, that may also be a motivator. <laughs> True enough, yeah. Okay. I think we, got, we have time for one more. And okay. um, this is about spiders. At, at what oh, is yeah. a good? <laughs> you knew there had to be one about spiders, right? Of course. Um, so spider phobia. Um, at what age would you begin treatment for that? Is is and is there a different age where you would start for different phobias, or is that kind of all the same? Yeah, I, I think that for me, and we just published an OCD study. Uh, it's coming out in JAMA Psychiatry soon on the treatment of young kids with OCD, ages five to eight. And we didn't see any age differences or an, an outcome between the fives and the eights. So my feeling is, is with a highly motivated five-year-old who's, who's verbal and gets it, I could probably do some kind of formal therapy. However, as a parent, um, I can do all sorts of things that are in the, in the service of moving towards situations that make us afraid and, and, and not moving away. So it could be that with a kid who's got a spider phobia, 
one of the first things that I, I could actually do with that kid is we could do some practices and we could do some uh, fun little things. Sometimes we, we'll do little things like, like go fish. We'll, we'll, we'll play with spider cards. So how many red spiders do you have? I don't know, go fish. We'll, we'll sort of incorporate the stimuli into, into fun activities, um, Spider-Man movies and that kind of thing. Uh, if a kid is completely terrified, then you don't want to move faster than the kid can. Um, but I, I, th I think these are the sorts of things that um, if, if my five-year-old has a spider phobia, it's probably not going to be a huge deal unless they're taking tremendous uh, evasive action like jumping out of windows to avoid them. Um, but if I've got a five-year-old with a spider phobia who doesn't care too much that they have a spider phobia, it's not in their way, I may want to wait. If I, if I have a ten-year-old with a spider phobia, though, who's already getting embarrassed about it and their friends are teasing them and they're putting fake spiders into their locker or that sort of thing, and, and they're not liking that. I, 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 I tell kids all the time in those circumstances, the best way to deal with that is to take the power away from them. And the best way to take the power away from them is to reduce your fear. And so you may have a more motivated kid at that point who, who sees that they, have, they, they need to take some control over this. Mm, there's more at stake for them at that point then. Yeah, it could, well, yeah. could well be. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, thank you again. It was a great presentation. I'm going to let Kelly finish up with her, her closing remarks, and um, that's it for me. Thank All you. Right. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar on treating specific phobias, when and how. There is an exit survey. Um, which we would need everyone attending to fill out. This discussion board, the, dis, the, the blog is open now and is available for the next seven days on the NJCTS website for any questions that were not covered in tonight's presentation. That website is www.njcts.org. Also, an archived recording of tonight's webinar will be posted to the website. Our next presentation, Getting Unstuck, How to Come Overcome Anxiety and Mood Problems with Behavioral Activation and Exposure, will be presented by Dr. Brian Chu and is scheduled for February 26, 2014. This ends tonight's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Franklin, for your presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Good night.